in spite of all I've done. Ah, don't, don't, don't rush past that line in the song. We, we, we want to get to the, you keep on looking out for me, Paul. Yeah, but he does that in spite of me being me. Me doing what I do. Jesus, nobody else but, yeah, yeah. That's that high tenor, Jesus. Yeah. Keep on looking out for me. How many of y'all need somebody to look out for you? Yeah, I believe we got some folk in here who have realized that you can't look out for yourself. That he's a great watchman. Yeah, he's watching not just us, but, but our souls too. Yeah, those things that we can't see, those intangibles. He's looking out in spite of all I've done. Y'all came with it this morning. Thank you so much. Jesus. Look. Come on now. Come on, come on. Hey. In spite of it all. Look, look, I got this feeling. I got this feeling, Red, that there's some folk at home who are who are desperately in need of some church. Desperately in need of some celebration in the service. They're at home longing to be in the service one more time. They, they just want to walk up through the front door, shake somebody's hand. And until we can do it, Jesus keeps on looking out for us. Yeah, he keeps on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I know it. I keep seeing different members tip up in here Sunday after Sunday. They, they just got to wake up and they come in singing, I'm glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service one more time because he didn't have to let me live. Yeah. No, he didn't. No. And I'm glad to be in the service one more time. Yeah. And then, then, then one more, time. One more time. Yeah, yeah. Look, 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 look. I was telling Karen when we were on the way to church this morning that we grew up church centric. Church is a part of who we are from when we were children. And to get away from that for a long time means that our spirits and our, our, our souls are panting like a deer panted, panted in the desert for some water. You got to be dry right now when it comes to having a church service. You, you got to be worn. I know you're getting a feel. I know this, this, this cyber sanctuary feels somewhat of a void, but ain't nothing like walking through the door. Ain't nothing like waving at somebody at the front. I see you up there. Oh, it's so good to see you. That feels your fellowship spirit. And we're missing that right now. And we pray to the Lord that it won't be so long before we get in here again celebrating with one another because we need it. Yeah, you, you may not have thought you needed it before. Yeah. Yeah. But we sure do need it now. We need it. We need it. Right now. We need it. I guess you can tell this morning I got up with a sum on my heart. Hey, hey, hey. Lord, if he had just given me a song. Karen would be woe out with this. <laughs> she hear me singing it all day long. It's my song. <laughs> the Lord gave me that song. Fred and Luther and Tasha in the house today. We're so glad to see them out of all the circumstances. God bless you. Thank you. So good to see you. I want to thank everybody who's been celebrating with us and all those who make this happen every week. Time marches on, certainly doesn't wait for anyone. And as uh, Cedric Sparks used to say all the time, just, just keep living. And that's all we can do. Yeah, all we can do is just keep living. And every day we get up and we try to do our part to make life better for somebody. Keep things going the way the Lord has blessed us. And I'm so glad 45th Street is positioned to be of service to people, to still minister to its uh, membership 
and even those who lie outside our membership roles, we, it's our responsibility to try to support them as best we can. And so, and so we say to all our ministry partners, all our brothers in Christ, all our friends in the Lord, God bless you. And I want to ask you to continue to pray for, in addition to Anthony's remarks a little while ago, I want to ask you to continue to pray for our own Deacon Paul Kelly, who's been hospitalized, who was hospitalized again this week. The VA had a heart attack. This is recuperating. Continue to pray for him. Also continue to pray for our own uh, cooker man, chef extraordinaire. Yeah, that cooking deacon himself, Walter, Walter Wright. Please continue to pray for him. And, and uh, is today his birthday? Is today his birthday? Didn't I see that on the announcements? Oh, it's tomorrow. I thought I saw his birthday on the announcements this week. I did. I got sense. Tyrone Hall, I want to pray for his family as well. And pray for his household. His sister had a stroke on Thursday. I want to make sure that we're prayerful for uh, the Bernie family. The Bernie family. And she recuperates. And so if you call me and let me know, I'll continue to be able to support and let the congregation know uh, what's going on. Had a great conference on the phone this week with the Nurses Guild. They still getting together and talking on the phone. Use technology to its maximum benefit. Uh, you may not be as savvy, but you can pick up the phone and call somebody. And you can call somebody else and tell them to get on the phone with you. We've had three-way calling for a long time now. Don't, don't get new on us. That's all, they, all we did was expand three-way calling. And that's all this technology and conference stuff is. And so please be aware of that. Today we got a message, I think, that the Lord has given us that is as timely as, as can be. It comes from the early church, the early New Testament church. The passage of scripture you need to look at is from the Acts of the Apostles. We're not going to get very far into the Acts, chapter 1. Verses 18 through 26 is where we're going to nestle in terms of our study this morning. I want to give you time to make sure you got it. If you're on your tablet, make sure it's Acts chapter 1, verses 18 through 26. Acts chapter 1, verses 18 through 26. If you'll let me, I'd like to read it for you in your hearing. Actually, the passage in the scripture that we're going to use as background starts at verse 15, but I just want to start reading at 18. I think that'll be sufficient for us. And it reads as follows. Now, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, Eseldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, quote, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men, which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out with us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who were surnamed Justice and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the heart of all men, show with whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Hmm. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell unto Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. 
for a little while this morning, I want to try to teach a little bit from this topic. Who will you vote for? Who will you vote for? I realize the King James Version of the Bible is a little thick and you may not have understood exactly the sequence of events that happened and so we'll try to bring it to light but voting is the term of the day in our country. Everybody's talking about voting. Voting has become such an issue. It's not only uh, what we wear, it's who we are right now. Voting is important. You show your allegiance to a certain camp through voting. Now, historically, in our country, we've had challenges in our system. Voting is not an easy topic in the African American community. No, 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 no. Voting is a topic which has demanded much of our community, and in fact, some of our most dynamic leaders have become leaders through the lens of creating opportunities to vote. People have gotten in good trouble by trying to make sure we can vote. People have died, not just African-American people, plenty of folk have died simply trying to secure our right to vote. We would be ignorant of historical facts if we think just black folk have died trying to get black folk or minorities the right to vote. History is simply does not support that context. If it had not been for other people of good thought and good cheer and good will, we still would not have, in this country, the right to vote. We, found, we faced unfair systems, but we've discovered that when we exercise the right to vote, that we can change the power, the balance of power. Uh, we haven't had money, we haven't had power or might, but we've had something more precious and that is the power to vote. Some years ago, the issue of voting crystallized in a small community in Ferguson, Missouri, where it seemed that the residents were not being governed by people who supported the cultural surroundings that they were in. All of this came to a head, as you well know, because of the murder or killing of a young man by a police officer. The city's population there was two-thirds African-American, but five of the six city councilors were white. And so was the mayor. There seemed to be an imbalance in that city. One would have thought after the polarization of the incidents surrounding the murder of the young man that African-Americans would have in large number jumped up and go on, go out and gone out and registered to vote. And in fact, that was reported immediately in the aftermath of the killing, that voting registration in that community had surged. Yeah, in a city of 21,000 people, the early reports were that 3,000 more people had come out and registered to vote. Wow. Clearly 3,000 people in a community that size registering to vote would have evidenced opportunity for wholesale change. Unfortunately, that figure was incorrect. When the analysis was done after the fact, and still to this day, the numbers have lagged significantly. Actually, after a detailed study, after the killing of the young man, when you would think interest in voting and changing a system would have been extremely high, the records reveal that only 128 people had registered to vote. What is it about voting that gets us so upset and makes us so lazy at the same time? What is it about voting that does not make us understand that we have the power to protest peacefully from being in the room? If we just go in the room, we can change things. The history of voting is very jaded. I've said before that we've died. We've been conflicted because we know that people have died for it. It's been preached to us over and over again. We struggle for the rights and gone through all the impediments that have stopped us from voting. Barriers in registration, barriers in casting the actual vote, centuries of obstacles, literacy tests, 
poll taxes. But we've also discovered, Reg, that when we unleash the power of the vote, we can change our destiny. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can empower our communities. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can elevate our own existence. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can open opportunities for people who did not see them. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can prepare our own policies. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can even win on things that we never thought possible. When we unleash the power of the vote, we can turn the son of a former slave into the president of these United States when we unleash the power of the vote. But when you don't vote, you say you don't care. When you don't vote, you disrespect the people who've died for their very right. And when you don't vote, you throw away your most basic right and you throw away your most valuable tool when you do not vote. Greatest power to effect change in this community under this system is the power to vote. Now, those of you who've gotten so righteous on me might ask the question, is there some spiritual guidance for us when it comes to voting? And I came to tell you, hardly is there any circumstance of life that you won't find some, some guidance in scripture. If you look hard enough, if your mind is creative enough, can I tell you that they didn't come from a foreign world? They were men and women trying to live just like you and I, and they had the same issues that you and I have. They had, they had an imbalance of power. What they did not have was a democracy. No, 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 no. They had conquerors who would come in and tear up the community, take all the good and get rid of all the bad. It's still there in the middle of all of this, there was an enclave of democracy that erupted. Ironically, it came in the early church. And the scripture that I quoted for you gives us a glimpse, I think, into how you and I can approach voting, what we can do about voting when it comes to helping our community and helping ourselves to do better. Yeah, we don't want to be like those folk who wants identifying an issue, we don't do anything about it. We don't want to be like those folk who haven't been assaulted in the community up in Ferguson. Gave an inkling of change, but did not follow through. They're not alone. I'm not picking on Ferguson. There are communities all over Alabama that got the same issue. Even here in Birmingham, we struggle with the vote. We got a whole lot of people who are passionate without a purpose. Yeah, a whole lot of folk who protest with no redress. We got a whole lot of folk who fight with no focus. Whole lot of folk who are whining but not working. Whole lot of folk who begin being loud but they're not logical. We also got a whole lot of folk who complain without campaigning. A whole lot of folk who struggle. But in this scripture that we have here, in, in this scripture that we have here, we have an opportunity to see how God guided a situation where there was a need to vote. To vote. Now, you might not see the word if you went and used your, your Google on the Bible and say, vote in the Bible. It might not say vote. What you'll probably see is a situation where they were casting lots. Casting lots, which is simply another opportunity for people to take their choice and make their choice plain. And there are many instances in Scripture of people casting lots. Yeah, the practice was widely used, particularly in the Old Testament. For example, the selection of a scapegoat. You've heard that, that terminology before. In Leviticus, chapter 16, was used, was determined by casting lots. The allocation of the tribal inheritance into the promised land was determined by casting lots. The determination of the families who had to relocate to give a proper dis distribution of the populace or the number of warriors who would come and fight was determined by casting lots. The order that the priests in the temple would do their duties was determined by casting lots. If you recall, in Luke, there's a story of a man whose turn it was, hear that, whose turn it was, Zacharias' name, to go into the temple 
and prepare all of the duties of the temple before um, it was time for the Passover. And he went in, and the angel came in and told him that his wife, who was well within age, would have a child. Turns out that those were the parents of John the Baptist. But it all started out because it was his dad's time to go in and perform his duties. All of that was determined by casting lots. And then the determination of an offender, whenever there was any question, was done by casting lots. All of those instances are in the Old Testament, and you'd be, you'd be remiss to not find instances in the New Testament, but this is the most vivid one that comes to mind. And because it's hard for us to discern the will of God, except through prayer and meditation, Sometimes we determine that there are human methods that you and I can use to make those decisions. But all of that is done also with consultation with the Lord. And so in this passage of Scripture, walk with me now, the disciples have a dilemma. Can I give you the history? Jesus Christ has been resurrected. Jesus Christ has ascended back into heaven. The disciples are in Jerusalem and they are not 12, but 11, which means that they have a space to fill. Why is 12 important? We'll say that in a minute. But they've got 11 of them. And they determined that they need to fill the bishop prick, which is just what I just read, the anointed space that was held by Judas. They need to replace him with somebody. And in order to do that, they determined that the way to do it is to ask the people to identify someone among them who can be the one to take, place, take his place, and then they will cast lots in order to determine which one it is. Now, let's give some background to this. It's not just 11 people in the room. There are about 120 people in the room. They're all gathered. I need you to understand the distinction in Scripture between an apostle and a disciple. An apostle and a disciple. Because too often we try to use that terminology interchangeably. But there's a difference between an apostle and a disciple. For one thing, the apostles were the 12 who Jesus Christ appointed as apostles. All right? The disciples were a whole lot of folk. There were hundreds of people who were disciples who followed Jesus Christ. Can I tell you right now, we got a lot of folk who follow Jesus Christ right now, but we got only one pastor in the church. We got preachers in the church, but we got a whole lot of disciples. The duties change, but we all have a responsibility to lift the name of Jesus Christ. But it's from this group of approximately 120 folk that Peter gets up in church one day, in the service one day, and he starts his discourse. He says that in order to fulfill the prophecy that's found in Scripture, and you'll find that prophecy in Psalm 69, Psalm 69, verse 25, we already read it, it just went perhaps over your head. In order to fulfill that prophecy, you need to vote to put somebody in Judas's place. Yeah. He said, we got to make that prophecy true. And so Peter goes on to tell them that the prophecy, unbeknownst to them, was concerning Judas Iscariot. Yeah. The prophecy found in Psalm, written so many hundreds of years before they were even alive, was in fact pertaining to Judas Iscariot. Because it was Judas life would reveal, which betrayed Jesus Christ. It was Judas who took the silver for the cause of betray betraying Jesus Christ. It was Judas who lay at the underbelly of the scheme that had Jesus Christ crucified. And once he determined that he had betrayed innocent blood, Judas took that money that he had taken from the priest and he threw it back at them. The priest, in turn, took that money and went and bought a field. By historical account, the field that they, brought, they bought is called Potter's Field, which is a cemetery that they use to bury people who have no means. Even in our community today, we have a public cemetery that's called Potter's Field. But if you look at the scripture, 
the, the, the psalm that was given, Psalm 69 and 25, it spells out exactly what was, what was going to happen. It says, let his dwelling place, his land, be desolate. In other words, nobody lived there. That's a cemetery. And let no one live therein. That's the history of Potter's Field, taken directly from Scripture. But the second part is where we are today. And if you read that, it gives us the guide as to how we move into this process. The second part of it uh, says clearly, and let his bishop prick, the office of bishop, another take. In other words, there was a call to vote. It's almost as if one of the major parties here in the country called a nomination convention. And they said, we need to nominate somebody to take his place. And then he goes into that teaching in the next verse. This is Peter now. This is Peter. I'm not lifting anything from Scripture that's not here. Peter says, wherefore, look around you, who among these men will you identify to take his place? But he gave them some caveats that had to be fulfilled. Can I tell you something? Watch this now. What's Peter doing? First of all, Peter's setting them up and leading them. Peter has assumed the role of leader of the early church. Y'all know this is strange? This is Peter, the impetuous one, the one who would say anything. This is Peter, the one who claimed he would never leave nor forsake Jesus. This is Peter, who struggled himself. This is Peter, out of all the other 11 disciples, the one that they're quoting in the beginning of the early church is the one who denied he even knew Jesus in the first place. This is Jesus, can I tell you, it's, it's, it's Peter who's taking the lead and saying, we got to make sure that we got 12 of us because the scripture calls for 12. Why 12? Because 12 was the number of the early tribes. When the land was divided for the promised land, it came and went to 12 families. And right now they're not whole from a spiritual standpoint. And he says, Jesus chose 12 and we need 12 to do this work. Some might ask the question, well, there are others around at that time. Why not choose them? Well, when you look at the requirements that they came up with, you'll understand why other people might not have been chosen. He said, and, I'm tra- and he's trying to reassure the early church that Jesus is gone, but we're still here. Jesus is gone, but we've been empowered and commissioned to do the work of carrying on and growing this church. And so he's reassuring All of his listeners, not just those from that day, but he's reassuring those this day that through the scriptures, there is a formula for us to replace Judas in the 12. And he's also reassuring them and saying that it's part of God's plan, not just man's plan. I'm not just doing this so we have another person to work. I'm doing this because God wants us to be constituted the way that Jesus Christ left us. So who should they choose? Who should they choose? And how should they choose this new person? And the answer comes in verses 21 through 25. He came up with the qualifications that this person had to have. That's important. Can I tell y'all, please stop electing folk that have no qualification. Please stop putting people over your life who don't have a life. Please stop letting it be a beauty contest, all right, because they look good on a poster. Please stop doing that. Please have more about you. Study these folk before you put them in office because if they are raggedy, guess what? They're just going to be raggedy when you put them in office. I had a good friend who is a long-term, long-term politician. I use that term loosely politician in Louisiana. He's a good man. We have different political beliefs, but we still friends. He's an older white man, but we still have commonality. He told me that it was hard for folk who didn't have any income to get elected to jobs and do them without feeling the sway of that income on their positions. 
In other words, the need to eat sometimes influences how you do your job. That's important. You need to understand, pay attention to folks' motivation. I guess the statute of limitations can run now. When I was in Tuskegee, I ran for an office in the Student Government Association. I won the office. It was the Office of Student Defender. It was one of the top, top SGA offices. Now, people would say he wanted to do that because he wanted to be a lawyer. That's true. I planned on being a lawyer, in fact, was applying for law school when I ran for the office, but that ain't why I ran. The reason why I ran for that office and ran hard, too, is because it came with a work study check. And I needed that work study. And, yes, I'm just being honest with you. That's my reason for running. And, and, and I got that work study check, and I needed that work study check to stay and get my degree. Now, did I do the job of student defender? Well, yes, I did it to the best of my ability. I'm just telling you what my motivation was. My motivation was that work study check that I got every month. Now, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm not revealing anything that nobody else don't know. All right, people run for different reasons. I did the best job I could do. I think I did a good job in the position, but I needed to eat while I was in Tuskegee, and that work study check helped me to eat. It's okay. My motives are clear. It's been almost 40 years <laughs> since I ran for that position. Can I tell you kids are still doing it right now? Oh, yeah, people are. Not just kids. Guess what? Other folk are doing the same thing. People in high office are doing the exact same thing. And one thing you need to ask is, if I'm going to vote somebody into a position, do they, in fact, have my best interest at heart? I don't have problems with anybody getting paid for the job they do. In fact, I think it's essential. In fact, I think the better you pay them, the better job you'll get from them. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I can go on record in saying that, that you'll prevent distractions. You'll keep them true to their ethics when you do that. They don't have to have a side hustle to do something else. Then they can concentrate on you and your business. So I think it's important. All right, and we can go on and on into that, but in this instance, there have to be qualifications. And Peter starts out by saying the most significant qualification for the person to assume the bishopric that was held by Judas is that this person must have been with Jesus from the beginning of his public ministry. Think about that. From the time that John the Baptist baptized him until he was resurrected and ascended, that's a core qualification. If you can't fulfill that qualification, then you're not eligible to hold that position. Watch it now. So that starts narrowing people down. Why? Why? Because I need to have somebody who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who understood what was going on with Jesus. I need somebody who saw him heal people. I need somebody who's a true believer because it stands to reason that if you saw him do these things over three years and you still standing here right now after seeing him crucified, you must still be a real believer in Jesus Christ. Because can I tell you, scripture is very clear that there are some people who follow Jesus, but they turned away from him. Because some of the teachings that he gave were very, very hard. Oh, yeah, when it says you got to love your enemy. Come on now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to love your enemy. You know that scene in The Color Purple when Suge come in and start messing with Oprah's character and, and, and she slaps her and the piano man start closing the piano and said, it's time to go. That's what folks said. When Jesus Christ said, you got to love your enemy, they said, it's time to go. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this no more. This man out of his mind. You mean these folk, these Romans who've been holding me down, who've been treating me and keeping me as a slave, I got to love him. Oh, no, this ain't the religion I'm looking for. Exit stage left. I'm trying to find something else. But it was only those folk. Who could understand the essence of that teaching? It was only those folk who had the heart to follow and know that when he says, not only do you have to, you have to help your enemy, you got to pray for them. 
Oh, yeah, Jesus was telling folks something that was radical. He said, you are somebody, but in order to be somebody, you got to pray for somebody else. Yeah, you're not the center of the world. God is. Everybody couldn't take that. And so even though there were hundreds, can I, can I make it real for you? Can I make it real for you? Now, Jesus could throw a party and four or 5,000 people would come. Oh, yeah, he could have a revival. And thousands of people would come listen to him preach. How do I know that? Because Jesus not only threw a revival, his admission price included dinner. Oh, yeah, he brought it. And if they stayed too long and had not eaten, Jesus made sure that every one of them there ate before they left. That's how many people were willing to listen to Jesus. But not everybody who was willing to listen to Jesus became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because what he was teaching was hard. And so Peter says to him, the replacement apostle had to be an eyewitness to everything that Jesus Christ had done. Yeah. Yeah. So out of these 120 people who are crowded in this room right now, out of these 120 people, identify somebody in here. So you can see them go around the room. Yeah, 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 you were here. You, were you there that day Jesus got baptized? Yes, yes, yes. So they narrowed it down. And of the list, the Bible said they came up with two folk. Two people out of 120 who fit the bill as having have been there the entire time that Jesus' public ministry, which was about three years, had gone on. Now think about it. Anybody stick with something for three years must be pretty committed. And those two who were identified were the ones who had seen Jesus Christ and all his ministry. And so the qualifying closed on two names. One person said, I nominate Joseph. Other folk knew him as Barsabbas. The Bible records his name as Justice, ironically. Justice. That was one nomination. Another person stood and said, I nominate Matthias. And we always equate everything to a democratic process. And this was about as democratic as the early church could be. You see, it would have been okay for the disciples to turn around and say, we choose you. No one could have doubted that they were in charge. Nobody could have said that Peter and the rest of them weren't in their right to have chosen somebody. But watch this now. Instead of making a theocracy where it comes top down from God to the people, they made it a democracy. And they let the people choose. You ought to hear something in this now. And think about how many times people have used the Bible to prohibit de democratic principles from being a part of how we live. Think about how many times throughout life the other people who did not want us to have access to the vote have told us that we didn't have a right to vote because we were less than somebody. Think about the Bible they went in and shaved out and, and, and created called the Slave Bible so they could keep us ignorant of how we were supposed to do things. And here it is in Scripture where a democratic process is how they chose an apostle. And yet, because we won't read, we don't understand that God gave us a process for how we choose good folk. And so we got two people. We got Justice and we got Matthias. Two of the folk who have been with Jesus the entire time. That's some serious qualification. Serious. And so then they had to determine how they were going to decide between Justice and and Matthias. Watch this now. You ought to circle Acts 1 and 24 and make it a part. You need to make a little index card and take it with you when you go vote every time. I don't care what the election is. You need to take it from you. It ought to be your voter's guide to yourself. You need to put it in there and understand what they did and use it. It needs to be on a t-shirt somewhere. All believers in Christ ought to be using this as the primer for how they select folk. Acts 20, uh, 1 and 24 says, and they prayed. Stop. And they prayed. Which means they looked 
to someone higher for the guidance on who to select because we can't know the hearts of men, but God does. We can't know the motives of men, but God can. We can't know what drives people, but God can. And so they look for heavenly guidance on how to make the decision. And they prayed. And in the prayer they said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. In other words, I got a sacred right when I go into the, pool, to the booth. When I go in the room to vote, I know, I know it's just one of those little portable deals. It doesn't look like a room, but it's a room. It's a room. It's a sacred room. It's a room that some folk couldn't get into. It's a room that some folk died trying to stand in. Yeah, that's important. That pencil you hold to mark that little ballot, somebody died trying to hold that pencil. The pressure, you marking that ballot in blood every time you do it. Somebody wanted to be able to stand there. Can I tell you, can I tell you in my preparation for this sermon, I read so many stories about people voting and one person uh, was lamenting the fact that their grandmother was born, was born in 1919. Women got the right, this is a black woman, women got the right to vote the suffrage in 1920. But it wasn't until 1960 that her grandmama was able to even go and register to vote 40 years after she was supposed to be allowed to do it. That's how they've been preventing us from voting. And we take this for granted. She should have at least just by the fact that she was by age, by 1940, she should have been eligible to vote. Another 20 years went by because of her race before she could even go and register. And we take this for granted. We let folk who don't vote have sway over us, have say over us. They play over us. They tell us what they're going to do for us, but they won't go and vote when they need to. We need to stop that foolishness. Yeah, the disciples said, pray that you would have discernment. Pray that you would know who to vote for. You go in that booth, take the Lord in there with you. Don't go in there on your own sins. Don't go in there on your own needs and your wants. I'm here to tell you right now. Me and the Lord going to vote on the 3rd of November. Me and the Lord going in the booth to determine who it is. I like Joe Biden as a person. I even am proud of Kamala Harris. But I want the Lord to tell me who I need to vote for. Tell me who I need to vote for. Guess what? Because I just believe this. If he tells me, he'll keep them and me locked into the purpose. Can I tell you? The other side of folk who don't believe like you believe, use this as a, as a validation for how they vote. They say the Lord uses imperfect vehicles all the time to do his will. That's how they justify voting for somebody who can do you wrong while claiming to be right. That's how they justify that. Don't play with folk who play with the Lord. Don't play with them. No, 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 no. They'll have you think that God would use a man who shows himself to be what he is every day and they would have you think he's doing God's work. Sometimes, sometimes we just know that God will allow a person to be what he is, but he expects us to use the common sense to see that as well. We don't have to cover up for that. And I'm here to tell you right now, when it comes down to the election on November 3rd, let the Lord be your guide. Use the common sense that he's given you and the right choices will be made. You don't have to badger anybody or beat anybody up. Just let the Lord be your guide. And so they prayed before going through the process for God to select a replacement. I don't know if it was close. I don't know what the count was. Destiny, they said they, used, they cast lots. Casting lots means they took rocks or something like that or, or marble or something 
And one color was for Matthias and another color was for justice. And you take your lot and you cast it in a bowl or cast it in a circle. And whoever got the most lots cast in would win. Can I tell you, there's a process. Anybody that's in a frat know this process. It's called blackballing. Blackballing, which means that there was always in addition to the color, to the colors or Matthias color or, 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 or Justice color, there was one little black rock. And if any member took that black rock and threw it in, that meant that person was blackballed and couldn't win. I know it happens. I've seen it happen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For whatever reason, they didn't like somebody. And the rules are that if anybody threw that black rock in, it didn't matter how many votes you got, you couldn't be selected for whatever it was. And I've seen, people's, I've seen people's college dreams get dashed to be in a fraternity or some other organization because somebody blackballed them for whatever reason. It's a game people play. And guess what? People are still blackballing folk right now. They're still trying to blackball. They don't do it physically. They do your character. Yeah, they blackball your character. They won't put, it, they won't put the blackball in the ring. What they'll do is put the black mark on your name. They'll put the black mark in your, in your social, uh, uh, social media presence. That's how they blackball folk right now. It's still happening everywhere. Oh, we got some we're dealing with right now, which is why you need to pray. Pray that you can get past the trolls. Pray that you can get past all of the, 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 the negativity. Pray that you can get past all of that. And then watch, watch what happens. You had to identify the one who was with Jesus the whole time, and look what you get. You get a product of somebody who thinks like you think, who has your values at heart. That's the product that comes out. And the Bible says, of the two who were offered for selection, Matthias was the one who was born. I, I love this part of this, of this sermon. Let me tell you why. Because so, after we have this vote that day, I challenge you to go in Scripture and find anything about Matthias. Find any scripture in the Bible that relates to Matthias after he was selected. And see, that begs a point. Everybody thinks that everybody has to be a rock star. Sometimes you just selected to fill that space, to make it whole. You don't have to be the one who's on billboards. You don't have to be the one who's out front every day. Everybody elected doesn't have to be a Barack Obama prone. Sometimes you just need to be there to help validate the policies that are coming out. Sometimes you just need to be, be there to make sure that people are done right. You don't need your name and lights. Matthias was chosen to fill a seat, and according to what I've read, he must have filled that seat right. No controversy behind his name. And that's a good thing. He simply filled the seat. Oh, now, Catholicism will tell you that there's a Saint Matthias. He was venerated. He was chosen. He was made into a saint. But nobody knows what happened to him. What did he win? What, what did Matthias win? This is what's amazing. He won the right to be an apostle and to work and serve and be martyred like the rest of the disciples. He won the right to go out into a hostile territory with the other 11 apostles and serve Jesus Christ. You want to know what his reward was, the prize that he won? Because people are always running for something, never realizing that sometimes when you put your head out there, it's on the chopping block. Sometimes when you put yourself out there, it's not you're going to be on all the TV shows. No, sometimes you're just going to work hard every day. Look, Matthew, he was one of the 12. He was one of the 12. What did he win for being one of the 12? What did, he, what did, what did Matthew win for leaving his tax collector's stand and coming and working for Jesus Christ? Well, clearly he's got one of the New Testaments that he wrote, but he also was killed by the sword in Ethiopia. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil. These are the apostles. This is what they won. This is the group that he joined. Peter was crucified in Rome, upside down on the cross. The same Peter who led the process to bring Matthias into the group. This is the valuable prize that he won by some standards, by today's standards. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. 
James, the son of Alphaeus, was thrown from the pinnacle of the church and didn't die. And so they dragged him through the streets until he did die. Judas, the son of James, was beaten and stoned to death. Bartholomew was peeled alive. Andrew was bound by the cross, stayed there preaching until he died. This is what he won. Thomas was run through with a lance. Matthias, the same one who we voted on today in this scripture, the same one, according to historical reference, was stoned and then beheaded. That's what he won. The right to put himself out there for Jesus Christ. Well, if they treated Jesus like that, what makes us think we too aren't going to be put on the chopping block? Luke, the writer of Acts, was hanged from an olive tree. Mark was dragged through the streets of Alexandria till he died. Paul, Paul, let's talk about Paul and I'm out of here. What do we learn from Matthias? Except he won the honor to be numbered with the 12. By folks standards, he can always have that t-shirt, I'm the 12th man, all right? He can put that on, he can wear that if that's what makes somebody happy. But what he did was he, he got the honor of serving with Jesus Christ. He got the honor of working toward the cause of Christ on this side. He got the honor of being with the other disciples, the other apostles. He got the honor of leading and starting and creating ministries across uh, North Africa and across all of Christendom. His name is still a part of that. Even though we can't see a whole lot of books written by him, his place is important. What else do we learn from him? Well, first of all, we learn that we need to understand that when it comes to a timetable, sometimes our timetable doesn't fit God's timetable. What does that mean? What does that mean? And I want to tell you this. I've learned that sometimes it's not how you win, but it's how you lose. And this is important. Losing right is sometimes better than winning. Let me tell you why. Because God may have something better for you or certainly different for you. Look, Matthias was there. He was there when Jesus picked the first 12. How many of y'all think that maybe he wanted to be one of the 12 that Jesus picked? But yet he wasn't. But even though he wasn't chosen with the first 12, even though he knew Judas, I'm sure he was like, Judas? Jesus done picked Judas? Everybody in town know about Judas. Judas steal from everybody. Oh, okay. So Judas going to be one of the disciples. He didn't do that. He still followed Jesus. Even after Jesus picked the first 12, he still followed Jesus. He still walked with him and believed in him. He still supported the cause. He still offered himself up after Judas showed himself to be what he was. We can learn a whole lot from Matthias. That sometimes our timing isn't his timing, isn't God's timing, but we still can serve if we stay faithful. That's what Matthias did. He stayed faithful, and when it was his time, guess what? He got the call to serve, and he was there for all of the ministries. He still got the blessing. He might not have been one of the 12. Oh, yeah, when they were around and all the people were there, I still believe this. You know when the disciples got together and Jesus was preaching? In all those instances, one time it was 4,000, one time it was 5,000, another time it was 5,000, and the disciples went around feeding people. Bible won't say this, but I believe Matthias was helping feed people. I believe he grabbed the baskets and said, man, I got this, don't worry about it, go help them folk over there. You know why? Because you don't always have to have your name on stuff to help people, to do God's work. Doesn't always have to be the disciples and Matthias. He was okay with just working in the background. That was ministry enough from him, for him. And guess what? If you do it with the right spirit, that doesn't go unrecognized. Sooner or later, if the Lord say so, you'll get that call. He fit all the qualifications, but the qualification he fit more than anything was he was faithful. He was faithful from the very beginning. He was a true believer. That's the first thing we learned from him. And the second thing is this. Labels aren't everything. Labels aren't everything, all right? What does that mean? People say, why is it that Matthias or Justice were the only two who were selected in that democratic process to, to replace Judas? Watch this now. Paul was alive. 
Paul was alive at the early church. Why wasn't Paul selected? Why didn't he become one? All right? Can I tell you something? Paul didn't meet the qualifications for that. Paul didn't meet the qualifications for that job. All right? Because at the time all that happened, he was Saul. Yeah, he wasn't even on the right side at that time. Somebody had to come and preach and teach him. Somebody had to show him a better way than the one he had. He hadn't been to Damascus Road and had hell slept out of, slapped out of him yet. But can I tell you, even though he wasn't selected that day, when he was selected, when the time did come, and can, let me give you some history on this now. And when Paul, who had had hell slapped out of him on Damascus Road, finally came back in the change of his life to the disciples, to the apostles, they rejected him. The original ones rejected him because they said, your history comes before you and we don't trust you. And it wasn't until members, some of the members of the early church said, we got to treat Paul like we treat all the other non-believers. And they allowed him into the fold and that act of mercy and grace allowed him to come in. And can I tell you, you might not hear about Matthias, but you hear about Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This is the same one who started out not believing, who later became the greatest believer of them all and the chiefest sinner. Labels aren't everything. Stop calling folk a sinner because they might be a sinner today and faithful tomorrow. You need to know that God is watching you and he's faithful. Can I tell you today that Matthias and the election of Matthias begs the question, who you gonna vote for? Can I tell you some time ago, I voted for Jesus Christ. There were other options. In fact, I had my name on the ballot. I realized that I wasn't good to be my own savior. So I went with somebody who had done it, who had walked it, who talks it, who still lives it. His name is Jesus. Who are you gonna select? Some of y'all got yourself on the throne right now. You need to understand that you're failing you and you can't get you to the goal you see. If heaven is your goal, ain't but one train going there and that's a Jesus train. Have you got no board yet? I, su I suggest you, you try him. I suggest you accept his gift, the ticket that he's given. The gift of salvation will get you all the way to glory. But it's not until you first say, Jesus, I'm with you. I accept your gift. I vote for you, Jesus. I vote for you to be not only my savior, I vote for you to be the Lord of my life. Question is, who you going to vote for? Today's the day for you to make a choice. Cast your life for Jesus Christ because he's already selected you.